think of the brain, I automatically think of the microbiome. To me, and the microbiome and the brain are really part of one whole. They're really inseparable. In fact, I believe that the whole brain is not just from what we find from our neck up, but it's really also what's in our gut. I like to think of them as really one unit, as one whole. Embryologically, the, br the gut and the brain, they start out at the same point. And then they, one goes up and one goes down. But when, they, when, when two cells start from the same place, they always retain a memory for each other. So the microbiome and the gut, the, the gut, the gastrointestinal system, is the housing for the microbiome, the trillions of bacteria, the friendly bacteria. They have direct communication to the brain. There's a bi-directional highway. They're constantly speaking to each other in so many different ways. They're communicating messages to each other. These messages are part of a, a, com a communication system that really outshines any type of communication system that we know of today with our modern technology. It's really staggering. And this communication actually mostly originates from the microbiome up to the brain. There's 400 times the amount of messages coming from the microbiome to the brain than from the brain to the body. We now have the ability to significantly bolster and enhance and improve that flow of communication, both improving the gut and the microbiome, and most important, improving the brain. Gut bacteria are really interesting because they affect much more than the gut. You know, one of the areas they affect is the brain. You know, there's this gut direct highway between the gut and the brain. It's the vagus nerve. So what's going on in the gut is going to affect your brain. And gut bacteria are affected by so many things that we do in our lives. Even the water we drink, you know, there's, we have chlorinated water, that's going to affect our gut bacteria. The antibiotics in our food are going to affect our gut bacteria. What we eat is going to affect our gut bacteria. So what, how you treat your gut bacteria is going to affect not only your gut, but your brain and the rest of your body. Many of us are starting to understand the significance of the gut as it relates to our overall health, including the brain. In fact, many scientists and physicians have begun to refer to the gut as our second brain. So speaking of the brain, um, you know, we're talking about, in a sense, a bacterial brain that lives in your gut. But there's also kind of a second nervous system called the second brain in the gut. So talk about how that influences your health and Alzheimer's and brain function and, and what people can do about it, what causes it. It doesn't really make sense anymore to uh, differentiate between the gut and the brain because they really are functionally very, very similar. I think that the, the relationship of the gut to the brain is both physical, but it's also chemical. We talk about serotonin and dopamine and so-called neurotransmitters. Failing to recognize that the lion's share of these chemicals are not made in the brain, they're made in the gut. Yeah. And they are made at levels that lead to mood stabilization when the gut is healthy. Intriguingly, we now look upon, for example, depression and inflammatory disorder as possibly having its genesis in the gut. How do we know that? Because markers of gut leakiness or permeability are dramatically elevated in correlation with depression as they are in uh, Alzheimer's disease, autism, and even Lou Gehrig's disease. You can begin to understand the importance of the gut health when you consider there are over a thousand species and three pounds of bacteria in your gut. There are trillions of bacteria in your gut. In fact, they contain at least a hundred times as many genes as you do. The bacterial DNA in your gut outnumbers your own DNA by a hundred times. You have about 20,000 genes, but there are two million or more bacterial genes. We've been taught by science and colleges, universities, medical schools, that bacteria are bad. They're disease-causing, they're virulent, they're pathogenic. There's something that we just have to obliterate and get rid of. It was the big enemy. With the discovery of the incredible, staggering uh, numbers of bacteria in, the in us, in the microbiome, there was a, the greatest turnaround in medicine, in science, in 150 years. From bacteria being disease-oriented, virulent, pathogenic, now, all of a sudden, they're, they're our greatest allies. In fact, that's what the research is showing. 
that bacteria on Earth and within us have one primary goal, to promote healing and to promote life. Outside of us, in the world at large, and within us, that's bacteria. I'm obsessed with our gut bacteria. And, and what's interesting, we have more gut bacteria in our gut than we have cells in our body. So we're actually more bacterial than human. We as a culture are obsessed with killing bacteria. We see bacteria as bad guys. Even in the holistic world or the functional medicine world, we see it as good and bad. But I see it a little bit differently. I see it as this inner ecosystem. We have an ecosystem in our gut and we have to balance it. Over the years, I've seen emotional, psychiatric and behavioral symptoms triggered by problems in the gut. Your gut, in fact, contains more neurotransmitters than your brain. It is highly wired back to your brain and messages travel back and forth all the time. When those messages are altered for any reason, in any direction, from the brain to the gut or the gut to the brain, your health will suffer. Dopamine is the main motivation neurotransmitter. And your ability to want to do things and to be excited to do things and to, to push yourself to do things associated with dopamine. So the person who can never finish tasks or even initiate tasks, um, those are patterns of low dopamine activity. Now, if you look at all the research, one of the most profound ways to raise dopamine is physical activity. <laughs> so when people exercise, their, their brain gets flooded with dopamine. Now, you have to have the initial motivation to start, but if that pathway gets started, then you can really flood the brain with dopamine. The other main neurotransmitter is um, serotonin. And serotonin is really involved with your, in a sense, your sense of mood is strongly involved with serotonin. But people that typically have low serotonin, they just, nothing really brings them joy. So it's not that they're depressed necessarily, it's just that the things that would normally make them happy are no longer making them happy, right? So they don't really have a favorite song anymore, or they don't have a favorite, <laughs> food or a favorite TV show, everything is just there, but nothing really excites them. And then when you look at the other main neurotransmitter, acetylcholine, that's your memory neurotransmitter. So your ability to recall things in your life and to find words and to uh, remember events, uh, to have photographic memory, those are all involved with acetylcholine. And then GABA is the calming down inhibitory neurotransmitter. <laughs> So that allows you, GABA levels are imbalanced. You may have things like anxiety um, as, a, as a key thing or restless mind. So those are the most common patterns with those four common neurotransmitters. Anxiety is an expression of stress. Anxiety is not a thing. It's a symptom. Depression is a symptom. All of these things, I, I would argue that mental illness in its largest frame could easily be viewed as these are symptoms of something going on. This is an alert mechanism. You're, you're depressed, not for some esoteric reason. I mean, you're, you're, your body is telling you that there's something you need to do. Altogether, your gut is a huge chemical factory that helps to produce vitamins, digest your food, regulates hormones, excretes toxins, produces healing compounds, and keeps your gut healthy. Intestinal health could be defined as the optimal digestion, absorption, and assimilation of food. But that is a big job and it depends on many other factors. The bugs in your gut are like a rainforest, a diverse and interdependent ecosystem. They must be in balance for you to be healthy. Unfortunately, many of us are living with a damaged gut microbiome. So what damages our guts? Many things are SAD, diet, our SAD diet, that's the standard American diet. This has led to a nation that is overfed and undernourished. Most of the country is eating too much food, but not getting enough nutrients. Nutritional deficiencies such as magnesium deficiency, zinc deficiency, vitamin D deficiency can wreak havoc on our health. Nutrition is probably the most important fundamental thing that's driving brain disorders, including sugar, which is a potent brain neurotoxin. It's addictive. In fact, it may be more addictive than cocaine, and it's deliberately pushed into our society where we're eating 152 pounds of sugar and 142 pounds of flour, which acts just like sugar in your body. And that's been linked to everything from depression to ADD, to even dementia, which is now called type three diabetes. I think the other major area of food that can be really harmful for the brain is the processed food in general, but a lot of the processed grains, the, the sugars, the added sugars, uh, especially sugars that have been altered from their natural state, you know, the corn syrup, so high fructose corn syrup. A lot of information now coming out on artificial sweeteners and how damaging that is to the brain. So I think that's 
a really big category of foods that we want to be careful with. And, and it's for a lot of reasons. I mean, you could be eating wheat bread or whole grain bread, but still once it's in that bread form, it's it's been stripped of a lot of its nutrients. So you're getting food that's missing some of its really important nutrients, its fiber, and you're also getting food that your body's going to convert a little bit quicker into sugar. And that's what we're realizing is that the more glucose or more of the rapid rise of glucose in your blood, and therefore also insulin, it has very damaging effects on the brain. The huge connection between the gut and the brain, and when the gut is not out of balance, when the bacteria, yeast, and or parasites uh, get out of balance, those things can trigger systemic inflammation. That systemic inflammation in turn can trigger withdrawal behavior. Uh, it can increase uh, molecules in the body called cytokines. And it's sort of like when you get this, the flu and it's really, you're really sick with the flu and you want to sort of just withdraw. That's what you do, and that's what depression. Food allergies are one of the biggest causes of a compromised gut microbiome. You may eat a piece of bread on Monday and be depressed on Wednesday, or have a piece of cheese today and get a migraine tomorrow. You'll never make the connection because you don't even realize food can have this kind of impact on you. Delayed allergies or sensitivities occur because many of our 21st century habits lead to a breakdown of the normal barrier that protects our immune system from the outside world of foods and bugs and toxins. That barrier is our gut. 60% of your immune system is right under that barrier. And when the lining of your gut breaks down, your immune system is activated by food particles that it misinterprets as foreign invaders, and this sets off a chain reaction leading to inflammation throughout your body, including your brain. The most common food allergies or sensitivities that I see in my practice are dairy, corn, soy, and the biggest beast of them all, gluten. Don't eat gluten. Gluten is bad for everybody. Now this comes not from me, not my voice, this comes from way up there, at the top of the totem pole. Uh, Alessio Fasano is a professor at Harvard, right? And when he came to, from Italy to be a professor at University of Maryland uh, Medical School, with $2 million of funding, because he's a brilliant guy, and he learned from the gastroenterologist that this thing about gluten is very uh, it's funny. A lot of people think gluten's bad for you, but the gastroenterologist really don't, we don't buy this. Except for people with, you know, the particular disease that has to go to with not having gluten not agree with you. And you have to do a biopsy for that and special tests and then, okay, now you're, you shouldn't eat gluten. But for the rest of us, it's not a problem. So he looked into it with his scholarly eyes and it turns out that gluten's bad for everybody. It opens up what we call the tight junctions. It's like the mortar between the flagstones on your sidewalk. If they get, the, the mortar gets loose, then the rain can go right through. If it's the, the, uh, the sidewalk of your digestive tract, then things that are supposed to stay in your intestine get through your blood, into your blood, without, being, without going through customs, so to speak. And that's, you don't want to have poopy stuff going straight into your blood, or even undigested tomato juice. And if, you, if it does, then it, it, it's bad. We all cut our teeth in studying the pros and cons of wheat by learning about celiac disease. That's where we cut our teeth. And so unfortunately, so many doctors think if you don't have a problem with celiac, mm -hmm. you, don't, you do not have a problem with wheat. Mm -hmm. But that's not true. Celiac is one manifestation of a problem with wheat, a sensitivity. And we know about 1% of the population has celiac disease in the US and in Europe, about 1%. We know in clinical practice, the studies say 30% of people that come into us in my practice, I look more deeply and I can find as many as 60% of the people that come in have an immune reaction saying, you've got a sensitivity to wheat. If the gut is weakened by a nutrient poor diet, high in sugar and low in fiber, by nutritional deficiencies of zinc and omega-3 fats, by the overuse of antibiotics and hormones, by exposure to environmental toxins, and by unprecedented levels of mental and emotional stressors, then the outside environment leaks into your body and your brain, and you develop allergies and systemic immune issues. This is called a leaky gut. Three basic abnormal reactions to foods can trigger brain injury. First, they can cause inflammation, which in turn inflames the brain. 
Second, small partially digested food proteins called peptides from gluten and casein can act to disturb the normal neurotransmitter function in the brain. And third, they can act as excitotoxins, increasing glutamate, an excitatory neurotransmitter, and creating a chain reaction that overexcites, injures, inflames, and ultimately kills brain cells. What inflames the brain is what inflames the gut. Doctors of the future will become experts not only in identifying inflammation, which we are already becoming increasingly good at, but in navigating the ultimate causes of that inflammation and putting out the fire instead of just dealing with the smoke. My personal road to a broken brain was rooted in heavy metal toxicity from mercury. All of my exposure to this heavy metal combined with genes that prevent me from effectively detoxifying the metals in my body led to a slow and significant poisoning of my cells and my mitochondria. And the effects were obvious. I felt weak, tired, I couldn't think, I had muscle pain and twitches, I had insomnia, digestive problems, food allergies, I had depression and anxiety. It was only by discovering high levels of mercury in my hair and urine and slowly detoxifying myself that I was able to get better. And I've seen this over and over in my patients too. From chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia to depression, anxiety, to obesity, dementia, Parkinson's disease, cancer, heart failure and heart disease, the message is clear. We are being poisoned by heavy metals. We are exposed to astounding amounts of brain pollution. According to the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, or EPA, about 2.5 billion pounds of toxic chemicals are released yearly by large industrial facilities. Even common medications contains heavy metals. For example, aluminum, which has been linked to higher risk of Alzheimer's, is found in antacids such as Gaviscon, Maalox, and Mylanta, that people swig like orange juice for heartburn. It is also found in our water, in our cookware, in foil wrap, and many underarm deodorants. Until recently, mercury in the form of thimerosal was the most common disinfectant placed in vaccines and contact lens fluid. I do think that we are overprescribing antidepressants for mental health issues. And that's problematic because we know that in many cases, exercise actually goes head to head in the literature with antidepressants and is just as effective. We know that some of these antidepressants aren't much more effective than placebo. We knew that some of these antidepressants actually have really concerning side effects and can lead to higher rates of suicidality. The fundamentals are that the brain is not um, able to deal with inflammation very well, that inflammation happens when we disrupt the gut bacteria by uh, a, a diet that's inappropriate, by taking medications that are disfavorable. What are the medications that screw up your gut microbiome? Well, I mean, the obvious ones are antibiotics. When you disrupt the gut bacteria by taking um, antibiotics, understand that is a lifelong change in your microbiome that is never the same again. One of the most common overlooked reasons for a damaged gut is stress. Have you ever wondered why most animals in the wild don't get ulcers? They don't live in a state of chronic stress. We humans do. We stew in our own stress juices like cortisol, which kills brain cells, shrinks the brain, and leads to dementia. It also causes crippling depression and other mood disorders. To treat depression and autism Alzheimer's or any disease that affects mood, behavior, or the brain, we must learn how to get rid of the causes of inflammation, such as leaky gut, and also to restore the normal immune balances through the food we eat, through nutrients, exercise, sleep, and stress management. You can impact your brain through your diet and heal your body. In fact, your body and your mind are not two separate systems. They're one elegant, continuous ecosystem. In our next episode, we will dive deep into devastating brain disorders that rob many of our elderly and even a few young people of a healthy and joyful life. Stay tuned for discussion around Alzheimer's and dementia, multiple sclerosis, and Parkinson's disease.